So the idea of language models is in a context, we want to predict the probability of different words occurring. So if the context is the students open there, there are likely words to appear like books, um, laptops, exams, um, minds, um, various words. And so effectively what we can do is put a probability distribution over what words will appear in a particular context. And so this very simple notion of a probability model over words has been incredibly influential in all areas of speech and natural language processing. So anywhere where you want a good model of what word sequences sound natural or information to help you decode in speech recognition, everybody everywhere uses language models. How do you build language models? Um, well, in the Dark Ages, which was prior to approximately 2012, shall we say, the way people built language models um, was you got a lot of text, um, you counted up how often different sequences of words occurred, and you could get conditional probabilities by dividing how many times the word, the, the word sequence, the students opened their books occurred compared to how often the sequence, the students opened theirs occurred. Um, this is a classic example of the curse of dimensionality because what we'd like to do is have, use a lot of context to predict, but the problem is there are zillions of words, you know, a quarter of a million or so in an average size dictionary, um, and then you're getting sort of squared cubed spaces of context. So there are just zillions of parameters and you can't possibly find enough text to estimate long context. And so at that point, there was sort of a sequence of games that were played. We made Markov assumptions and said, I'll tell you what, a couple of words of context will be enough. Um, even then you have to do methods of probabilistic smoothing using mixture models and things like that. Um, but this is already enough to introduce this question of how do these models relate to um, linguistic theory, the structure of language that people would think about in linguistics. And the answer for sort of 30 years, often passionately argued by linguists, has been, you know, these models just in no way capture um, the intricate rich structure of human languages. I mean, yes, they know a bit in some kind of disaggregated way. They capture the fact that you tend to get word sequences like preposition, article, noun, article, adjective, noun. Um, but that's mixed together with a lot of just world knowledge stuff of what th kinds of things ships do or students do. Um, but at any rate, they don't have any abstraction. They don't capture concepts like parts of speech, like nouns and verbs, let alone more of the grammar, the structure of a human language. And so um, for the last, well, for as long as NLP's existed, I guess, really, the answer for trying to capture the structure of human languages is that we've built explicit models that try to put that latent structure over sentences. And since about 1990, the main way in which that's been done is that humans hand annotate long stretches of linguistic text with structure, such latent structure, such as parts of speech, grammatical structures of sentences, or in this example down the bottom, co-reference, co this is then which um, noun phrases are mentions of the same entity. So President Xi Jinping on his first state visit to the United States showed off his familiarity. That, so those three mentions are co-referent. And so people have spent several decades um, annotating large amounts of human language text with this kind of information and then building models, normally empirical machine learning models to recover this kind of structure. And in some sense, that's an echo of what has been the dominant position in linguistics ever since the 1950s, most prominently espoused by Noam Chomsky. So from his ver very earliest work, um, Noam Chomsky has argued that the amount of evidence that human children get is too limited too noisy, too unclear, that human children could possibly um, work out the intricate structure of human languages just from the input that they receive. And he's therefore proposed that it's actually part of the human genetic endowment, that there are language specific um, endowment in the brain that allows humans to understand human languages. 
And for those of you who have had children at some um, time, there is something really miraculous about the speed with which kids um, decode human languages, that you have this sort of long period where the kids can say sort of one and two word things like mummy or want juice or something like that. And then it sort of seems like there's this really fast period um, when the kid sort of goes, whoa, there's a recursive system here. I can say, um, daddy, mummy said, go to store, buy milk, bring, home dinner, um, and it suddenly then they, their um, productivity um, really takes off. Um, I don't really endorse this view though, and that's what we'll come back to um, later. So what's happened more recently with language models? Okay. Um, so in the Enlightenment era, um, really sort of only generally um, in the 2010s, so the, the central idea goes back um, a decade or two before that, um, the central idea was, well, rather than having these categorical words as the units over which to make language models, we can instead of that um, represent the words by a vector of real numbers. And so then once we do that, we have a solution of sorts to the curse of dimensionality because these um, vectors can represent in a multi-dimensional way similarities between different words and our models can exploit that to um, do a better job at prediction. And that was the initial um, breakthrough work of Joshua Bengio and colleagues. So that gave us a way of avoiding the curse of dimensionality, but as well as that for then um, dealing with getting conditioning from long context. So often we want to have conditioning from very long context. So here's a sentence from an Arthur Miller short story. The same stump which had impaled the car of many a guest in the past 30 years and which he refused to have removed. Um, to know why the word removed is likely there, you're not do it, going to be doing well if you're using any kind of Markov model and your conditioning context is he refused to have. Um, you really need to be getting back to the knowing about the stump for the word removed to be likely. And so that led to the introduction of recurrent neural networks, which then maintain a state through time and give us at least some hope of doing those kind of long distance predictions. So what we have then as our picture is we start with words, the students open there, we have embeddings for these words which we learn. We then feed that through a recurrent neural network which builds up a state um, at each time which maintains a representation of the history. And based on that recurrent state, um, we then predict the probability of different words occurring as the next word. Um, but that was how things were for about, um, decade that people were just sort of regarding things in this direction. But around late 2017, 2018, people really um, singled in on an observation of, well, what we've been doing here gives us an opportunity to extract a lot more power in representing and working with language. Because we can take this hidden state here and rather than just saying it's a hidden state of a recurrent neural network, we could suggest this is a meaning for the word students appearing in this particular context in which we found it. And that has proven to be just a very useful notion um, which we've made use of hugely in the last couple of years. So it's always been the case that for understanding the meaning of words um, that people have, well always, in the recent sort of 50 years have built models of word meaning by looking at the words that occur in the context of a word. But the standard way of doing that is that you learn one meaning for a word type, so for a particular word. So here's the word banking and what you do is collect up lots of contexts of banking and then analyze them all and say, okay, I've generated a meaning for banking which might itself be a word vector. But it turns out the meanings of words vary enormously in different contexts of use. Um, so here's um, a list of meanings of the word, well, the uses of the word broke. I broke a vase, that's maybe canonical, but dawn broke is rather different. He broke the silence is very different. Sandy broke the law. The burglar broke into the house to necessarily break anything. The newscaster broke into the movie broadcast. We broke even, even. There are all kinds of meanings. And traditionally, people have worked with 
notions of uh, dividing a word into word senses. That's what a dictionary does. But arguably, you get all of these senses of words which are overlapping and related. And it's perhaps a more flexible, useful notion to say, well, what we really have is we have a meaning of a word in context, and we should be able to compute that with the help of the context. And that's what this model is doing. So over the last couple of years, there's then been this dramatic result that people have said, well, let's take this idea of context deep contextual word representations, taking those hidden states of a neural network and just scale it up to really big neural networks. And there have been a succession of pieces of work where effectively people have been building ever bigger neural networks to generate um, these deep contextual word representations. And what people have found doing that is that as your representations and your amount of training data gets bigger and bigger, there's just um, a huge improvement in how well these models work. Um, so one of the um, demonstrations that was widely shown in the press was for this GPT-2 language model where they showed story generation starting from initial prompt. So the initial prompt written by a human was a train carriage containing controlled nuclear materials was stolen in Cincinnati today. Its whereabouts are unknown. And then the um, neural language model was producing. The incident occurred on the downtown train line, which runs from Covington National Stations. In an email to Ohio news outlets, the US Department of Energy said it's working with the Federal Railroad Administration to find the thief, the theft of this nuclear material, dot, dot, dot. Um, and compared to early um, models, which just sort of knew a little bit about word associations, it's just kind of amazing how this model has absorbed and is able to use in its generation so much context, right? So it can pick up from the fact that because it's nuclear materials, it's reasonable to invoke the US Department of Energy because it deals with nuclear materials. Um, because there's mention of a train, it's reasonable to invoke the Federal Railroad Administration. Um, there's um, something stolen, so there's a thief and a theft, right? That is able to take all of these contextual cues from far away and then integrate them and produce language um, that is very coherent and human-like. Um, so coherent and human-like that in the popular press version of this, um, that this is an artificial intelligence so powerful it must be kept locked up for the good of humanity. Okay, um, so part of this is just scaling and making things bigger and bigger. Um, but the other um, part of this is that for all of these models, apart from the first one, they used a new type of neural network called a transformer network.